Our next panel is Mr. Gregory Wrightstone, a geologist, author, and expert reviewer of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He's the sixth assessment report. Uh, Mr. Gordon Toome is our other panelist, senior fellow, Commonwealth Foundation. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us, and you can begin when you're ready. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank the chairman of the committee for the opportunity to provide my science and fact-based analysis on Governor Wolf's proposal to add the Keystone State to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. My qualifications include degrees in geology uh, from Waynesburg University and West Virginia University. Um, I'm an expert reviewer for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I also uh, write significant commentaries exposing the many climate change hoaxes that are presented to the public as fact. Uh, most recently, the National Climate Assessment's uh, stated fact of increasing fires, when in fact I showed that the number of fires in the United States and even in California are in decline. Uh, also, the recent UN report on the looming sixth mass extinction event, uh, according to this one million species, would go extinct over the next several decades, requiring 30,000 species to go extinct a year, when in fact the reality is only two species have gone extinct on average per year over the last 40 years, just as two examples. Uh, Governor Wolf's proposal to abate greenhouse gases in the state, as uh, is, is described in his executive order, would have serious ramifications for the state and its citizens. And because of this, the governor and the committee should make recommendations that are based on science and facts not on a politically and media-driven narrative of the Keystone State f facing imminent and catastrophic consequences from our actions. I'm going to focus today on just two factors here. One will be uh, the justification that was presented in the executive order and by the governor himself, and also, secondly, on the effects of temperature and the proposed reductions of carbon dioxide. Uh, before I get started my prepared remarks, I want to deal with some things that were stated before. Um, I was called a professional science denier earlier and worse. Uh, so maybe we should uh, go over what I actually I believe. I believe CO2 is increasing. It is. And it's mainly due to man's burning of fossil fuels. That's a fact. I also believe CO2 is a greenhouse gas and contributes some warming to the atmosphere. It is. It just does. Uh, the, big, the big difference that we have here, and there, yes, Virginia, there is a debate. The debate is, is the temperature rise of a degree plus that we've seen over the last 100 plus years, is it mostly uh, anthropogenic, man-made warming due to CO2, or is it from the same natural forces that have been driving temperature up and down uh, since the dawn of time? Secondly, the most, one of the really key uh, takeaways here is what we don't hear too much about. We only hear from the media and some of the other presenters of the catastrophic consequences of, of ch our changing climate. Uh, what I talk a lot about and present as facts uh, is the overwhelming evidence of rising temperature and increasing CO2 having tremendously beneficial uh, aspects to the earth. I'm not going to get into all that this morning. Uh, the science that's behind that is stark and overwhelming. What we're seeing is an earth and its ecosystems that are thriving and prospering and humanity's benefiting, uh, and it's not even close. Uh, the other thing we heard about today was a 97% consensus. Uh, the, the uh, DEP secretary must have misstated. He got information wrong. That was not from NOAA. It was from a study by John Cook. David Legates, Dr. Legates spoke earlier. He, was a, uh, he, he wrote the peer-reviewed study that completely disputed that, showing that actually the same studies reviewed by the Cook study showed that less than 1% of the scientists actually agree uh, with catastrophic man-made warming. Uh, also, uh, we, we've heard that CO2 is a pollutant. Uh, that was based on the Obama administration endangerment studies. I expect that to be overturned. CO2 is not a pollutant. It's a miracle molecule uh, that uh, we, should, we should appreciate. We're at about 410 parts per million. We've added 130 parts per million uh, uh, to the atmosphere of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. 130, I'm not going to do a lot of numbers, in the last 140 million years, we've gone from 2,500 parts per million, six and a half times what we are today, almost in a strong low levels of CO2. Looking in the geologic context, 
Earth has averaged 2,600 parts per million. We are actually today, we don't have too much CO2, we don't have enough. We're actually CO2 impoverished if you look at the geologic picture. Uh, to get into my remarks, uh, several negative impacts on the Commonwealth were listed in the executive order as justification for the increases uh, of electricity costs that are proposed. Uh, the first claim is that current warming trends are expected to accelerate by 2050 and increase by 5.4 degrees. Uh, the fact is we have seen about a degree and a half of warming since the early 20th century. The other fact we don't that's not mentioned is that that warming trend that we're in started 200 years before that. We know that it started in the late 17th century. And we also know that at least 200 to 250 years of that warming trend was entirely naturally driven. It just had to be. So we're being asked to believe that, well, yeah, we had 200 or 250 years of warming that was naturally driven, but now it's from us. Our, our, we're, the, we're the reason. We also know, looking back through geologic history, if we look at 4.5 billion years, we see that the Earth's temperature has not been driven by CO2. We see times when CO2 levels were 10 times what they are today, and we were in ice house conditions. We also see times when CO2 levels were very low, and there was no ice on either pole. We also, and if we look at the ice core data from Antarctica, we know, and it's a consensus of this, that for 800,000 years from the ice core data from Antarctica, temperature changed and then CO2 changed. So temperature was driving CO2 for the last 800,000 years. So we're being asked to believe, think about this, and that there's a consensus on that. Uh, there's really no disputing it. We're being asked to believe that for 799,900 years, CO2 didn't drive temperatures. Oh, but it just changed in the last 100 years. That's not how geology and science works. Uh, so uh, the other thing we look at here, so we're, we're being told of catastrophic levels of warming. Uh, if we look at the next one, the uh, United States Climate Reference Network. We heard about da uh, Dr. Legates talking about the the uh, uh, the uh, 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 heat island effect of, of thermometers. We look at this, and this this was established a network that was established in 2003 to remedy that urban heat island effect. And we see uh, this is U.S. data only, surface thermometer data. We see that in fact there has been close to zero warming since that time for the last 16 years. Uh, bear in mind, none of the models that have been so prominently touted here this morning predicted that. Now, this, this pause in warming, uh, it may end next, next month or next year. It may get cooler. We don't know that. Uh, but we know that for at least 16 years, there has been no warming. Uh, the other claim that's touted by the governor and the RGGI uh, the executive order, is that increasing precipitation due to man-made warming is leading to an increase in extreme weather events and flooding. Uh, Governor Wolf re referenced heavy flooding in 2018. It is a fact that 2018 saw the highest amount of precipitation on record in Pennsylvania. But there is no long-term, looking at the data from 1970 on, we've seen no long-term increase. So I think the governor uh, was uh, confusing weather events with climate. Uh, in fact, if we look at, at the NOAA data, I, what I went to uh, just this week, looked at the NOAA data, I looked for the big rain events, the all-time longest streaks of heavy weather. Uh, and we find that those events actually peaked in the 40s and 50s. Uh, so there's, we saw no, zero increase in wet conditions. Also, the EPA's National Drought Severity Index, which is figure three, uh, shows no increase in wet conditions in the lower 48 states. Uh, we also see that uh, perhaps the governor was looking out his window in 2018 and, and remembered the flooding of, of the Susquehanna here in Harrisburg. Uh, and it, was, it, it, it did flood in 2018, but perhaps the governor is not aware that uh, there were 28 higher floods that dwarfed this. This was the 29th highest flood in 2018. And to conflate that and say we need to take uh, dramatic and harmful economic actions to solve this what I believe is a non-existent problem uh, is, needs to be rethought. Uh, also, the, we've been told that deaths will increase due to man-made warming, due to heat-related illness, and increasing air and water pollution. Uh, the fact is that's not supported by the data. It just is not. Uh, numerous studies confirm significantly more people die 
due to cold-related deaths as from heat-related deaths. The largest study of its kind was Dr. Antonio Gasparini, looked at 74 million heat-related or temperature-related deaths and found that 20 times as many people die due to cold as due to heat. Another similar study dealing with uh, the United Kingdom and Australia, their conclusion was that it was 15 times as many people die due to cold as due to heat. So the fact that uh, actually I think it, we could actually make the statement rather than the alarmist uh, scenarios proposed today, I think we could all agree looking at this data that global warming would save lives. Uh, allegations of increasing pollution are not supported by the facts. In fact, the EPA just released a report uh, just a couple of weeks ago reviewing the data in Compass 2018 and stated that there's been a long-term improvement in unhealthy air days. Uh, and by every metric, pollution has been in significant and continuing decline. Uh, the most important thing that I, I would ask for you to remember today is what we're about to talk about. And that is, what if we imposed RGGI, and what if we were able in Pennsylvania to reduce 100% of the carbon dioxide emitted by electricity? That's an important, that should be maybe the most important thing considered by the committee here. So what is that? So the primary goal of Pennsylvania's participation in RGGI is to alter the Earth's temperature by removing CO2 emissions. Uh, likely, again, today, the most important factor in our discussion is just this. According to the latest U.S. Energy Information Administration, Pennsylvania emissions account for 217 million metric tons, or 4.2% of the United States output. Of that amount, 37%, or 80 million metric tons, were generated by the electricity sector. Estimates of how much future warming will be averted can be calculated using the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas-induced climate change developed by the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And according to this model, assuming that 100% of the state's electricity generation of CO2 emissions were eliminated, if we eliminated all the electricity generated CO2, it would avert one one-thousandth of a degree Fahrenheit in warming. One, um, let me repeat that. If we reduced all of our CO2, we would avert one one-thousandths of a degree Fahrenheit in warming by the year 2050, and it gets better, three one-thousandths by the year 2100. There's no disputing the incredibly small temperature rise that would be averted by a reduction in carbon dioxide in emissions from Pennsylvania. This infinitesimally small change in temperature is well below our ability to actually measure changes in global temperature. In defense of enacting economically harmful regulations and energy cost increases, proponents tell us that the world's countries must act in concert in order to meet me meaningful changes. That, however, is definitely not occurring. The world's top two consuming countries, China and India, are instead, instead steeply increasing both their coal consumption, their coal mine uh, openings, and also their coal-fired generation. Uh, and we've seen that... Uh, just last week, the uh, newly appoint, appointed uh, deputy, uh, deputy of, uh, of Energy by Donald Trump stated that our 14% reduction in CO2 emissions from the United States will be replaced in, in less than a month and a half by increases in CO2 emissions from China. And with that, the, I'll just conclude that uh, we've seen the justifications stated for joining the RGGI are not supported by the facts and the science. Any reductions in Pennsylvania's carbon dioxide emissions are so small as to be indistinguishable from zero. This proposal would infringe on the freedoms of people, make them significantly poorer for virtually no advancement of the stated intention to avert global warming. The legislature, the business community, and all right-thinking citizens should stand against this economically crippling and unneeded proposal. In short, it's a solution in search of a problem. Thank you.